Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yatmolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Uh, I'm joined by Tetyana Oharkova, who is in charge of international outreach of Ukraine Crisis Media Center. We're making this podcast about the war which Russia started against Ukraine since 24th of February. Hello, Tanya. Hello. So today we will talk about Kharkiv, a very important city. Uh, we can say it's a city fortress, 40 kilometers from the Russian border. We w- visited this city a few days ago with the humanitarian mission uh, Ukraine World, Pan Ukraine, Ukraine Crisis Media Center. We brought some assistance for Ukrainian uh, soldiers who are defending uh, this city. And we have seen what what's happening. So, what is what are your impressions about the visiting the city? This visit was extremely important for us personally because it was like we were going somehow back in in time, because Kharkiv is living now what Kiev have lived maybe in March or April, maybe in April in April, so one month ago, one month and half ago. Uh, Kharkiv. Let's let's explain maybe to our listeners that um, Kharkiv is the second city in Ukraine of, with a population of uh, one. 0.5 million of people. So uh, Kharkiv is, was also capital of Soviet Ukraine starting from 1919 until 30, uh, 34. So during 35 years, it was a capital of this country, of the Soviet Republic. So quite a long time. This is industrial city. This is a city close to Russia, very rich in culture very rich in these um, cultural, I, I don't know, bridges with, bo- with both Kyiv and maybe with Russia as well. Um, Kharkiv was claimed to be a Russian-speaking um, city, at least until 2014. Things have changed in 2014 because Kharkiv was, it was an attempt during this uh, first aggression of Russian Federation against Ukraine to control Kharkiv. Uh, there were people trying to take these administrative buildings, but they failed. So Kharkiv has already experienced of this Russian um, invasion. We were very much worried in the beginning of this full-scale invasion in February because we were seeing the kind of images of Russian tanks entering the city. And I, I will never forget this image of Oblast administration bombarded by missiles it was maybe the, maybe one of the the first uh, attacks against civilian infrastructure not military one so and th- at that very moment we decided to it was a part of our decision to flee to, to to go to the west of the country just to be in security i mean for our children and for our parents but i, I will never forget that and we we were so eager to to go there to Kharkiv to see with our own eyes what was going on and it's quite impressive now because today you can take a simple train just a normal train and you travel there just in in the previous life there to the city and you see that uh, city tries to live normal life despite constant shelling and uh, it's still bombarded i mean many many um, places in kharkiv are destroyed but the global impression is the city continues to live yes we can compare it with kiev Uh, i think that uh, people started coming back to kiev of course earlier because uh, well kiev is uh, still under the target of russian missiles but kharkiv is different it's not only about missiles because several missiles we have seen the the now the building of the regional uh, administration which is just a skeleton of the building uh, we have also seen some other buildings they are also in the central uh, central kharkiv including for example the university building contrary to kiev in which we don't see well, the, the the war, of course, missile strikes to the Kiev downtown, mostly not to the downtown, but a little bit far away. In Kharkiv, you, you really see the the buildings in the downtown, including the uh, administration buildings, uh, which were targeted. Yeah, and that's it. And the the most important issue you started to, to talk talk about that is that Kharkiv at that very moment is still the target for Russian artillery, not only for missiles, but it is closely geographically close to the border. And still, let's also fix it for our listener that at that very moment, about 30% of Kharkiv region is still controlled by Russian army, because it, it was a kind of huge, great, really great... Not the city, but the oblast. Uh, oblast, the region. oblast re- region, region. Ukrainian army started its uh, counter-attack uh, in Kharkiv region in the beginning of May. Um, 
if I'm not mistaken, 5th of May, maybe, maybe around that date. And it lasted for two or three weeks. And they were lucky enough to liberate the most of the, of the region, but not the, the whole part, because the north, north, northern part of this region, it is strategically important for Russian army, because they, they have a railway going to down to Lugansk region. And they that's why they are so... Uh, eager to keep it. Still, some troops are on the ground and they're quite close. Uh, for example, village uh, Tsirkuni, some, somewhat nine or ten kilometers to the northeast of Kharkiv, is still under constant shelling every day. And uh, some artillery systems are able to reach uh, um, several districts in Kharkiv as well, st- st- even today. So we are not talking about missiles, we are co- uh, talking about ar- uh, artillery. And when you arrive in the city, uh, I remember this uh, this uh, sound we already forgot here in Kiev. You know the sound of artillery is very close. It means that people they this is not a normal life. They they feel the presence of Russian army, which is not so far away, maybe uh, 30, 40 kilometers from the city. So it changes everything. But at the same time, you're quite impressed when you arrive to Kharkiv today that you you see people in the streets. Quite a lot of cars. Mm, Kharkiv is quite a big city with very broad streets. So the population of Kharkiv is 1.5 million. So it, let us say, it's at least twice, maybe three times less than Kiev. But still, the city is huge, and people are coming back. As far as we understood, people are coming back, and some people tragically come on coming back because there were families already back in the city, and one of the families was killed. Um, Several weeks ago, two weeks ago, um, baby of five five months old, and the father was killed by by this shelling, and the mother was wounded at that very moment. So there were people who escaped from Kharkiv during these dark times in March and April. They were back and they were killed in the city. And even today, there were not news about civilians killed in um, in the city. By the way, when we left from Kiev to Kharkiv, there were missile attacks on on Kiev. Uh, on several places so it also shows that uh, Kiev is also is not a safe city but in Kharkiv you s- you have this district the famous district Saltivka I think there is several hundred thousand people are living there right yeah. up to half a million and it it is heavily damaged especially the the streets which are from the, the road the ring from road. For which Russian tanks were arriving yes arrived. this is horrifying all those huge buildings of uh, 16 floors for example they just are burnt like a like a piece of a piece of wood you see the people who are coming back to get some some of their belongings uh, uh, this district was closed for public uh, until two weeks ago because it was extremely dangerous to be there and we imagine that we have witnessed the people coming back so maybe they were allowed finally allowed to go back to their homes and we do hope that uh, mm, not a lot of people were killed there because there were massive shelling from the very first hours of Russian uh, Russian invasion and we do hope that most of people were able to leave this district but still what we see so it's it's about thousands of people maybe tens or maybe tens of thousands of people who lost their homes and what um, people say on the ground that it will be impossible to repair these buildings so the only solution is to to destroy everything and to rebuild something else in a different place so this is a lost place in a way this is a lost place in, in a big city this is only part of the city but still it's lost home for for many many families but that uh, we are talking about a specific several specific streets if we're talking about the whole district also the people are coming back so we we have seen quite a few number of of people quite a few number of cars the markets are starting to reopen let's say that the markets uh, is a very important topos for kharkiv uh, and there is a, a big market, I think, the, the biggest market in Eastern Europe, which is called Barabashova, which was also a target for, for Russian attacks. There were some, some incendies, some fires. But it seems that in some parts of this market, uh, people are already coming back to trade. And this is also remarkable. 
how Ukrainians in different places, if, if we went uh, across the villages, for example, here in Kiev, and we have seen how many people are coming back to their life, they're seeding their, their plants, so that they're really trying to, to get it. And, and here in Kharkiv, really people trying to reopen their shops, coming back to the, uh, to the, to, to, to the markets, for example, etc. Yeah, that's it. So this is a kind of a new life for Kharkiv. And I'm still wondering why the Russian army was not able to take Kharkiv, because maybe because it's too big, maybe because it was too, um, for, it's for fortify. Well, but the, they didn't even approach it. So the, they shelled it heavily. We have seen these fights. Basically, you, you, you see it's very clearly. So they shelled the residential buildings, but it's only on the outskirts of the city. But there were also tanks inside Kharkiv. In well, the there were days. tanks inside right. Kiev. As well. So it was the same scenario, but it was too big and too strong to for for their army. But they stayed quite alone in Kharkiv region, uh, longer than in Kiev or Chernigov or Sumer region, because in Kiev they left in the end by the end of uh, March, and so it took one one more month for Ukrainian army to push away Russians from Kharkiv. But so forty kilometers from the Russian border. So, so still, this is a kind of when you are talking about existential danger at the border, talking about the whole Ukrainian Kharkiv, you feel that because you are just really close to Russia. And uh, one of my reactions was how it's possible to live so close to Russia. So it is something incredible. You cannot longer really live so closely to to Russia. Let's talk about the other side. So the cultural life is also is also there of course Kharkiv is now famous for um, I think one of the genius Ukrainian writers Sergei Zhadan uh, the, 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 the one of the symbols of Ukrainian literature right now and uh, we made a short interview with uh, with Sergei Zhadan Для Харкова війна почалася дуже швидко росіяни були у нас на окружній вже за пару годин це не так далеко від російського кордону вони зайшли з півночі з боку Липці, Циркунів, і там почалися бої. Себто, знову ж таки, як це не дивно, ну, це не дивно, ми то знали, стан нашої армії добровольчих підрозділів Харків був готовий, Харків відразу почав захищатися, а ось росіяни до цього були не готові, і, відповідно, не так і не змогли зайти в місто. Ті спроби прорватися через лісопарк, або через окружну, або за допомогою ДРГ заходити в місто, закінчилось для них дуже печально, їх просто палили тут. Вони зазнали в перші дні великих втрат, і, власне, потім почали бити із, із градів, із артилерії, знищувати цілі, цілі квартали, цілі мікрорайони, зокрема, і передусім північну Салтівку. Місто швидко спорожніло, і перші дні це був такий певний колапс, звичайно, все це працювало лише військові. Плюс відразу включилися волонтери, плюс включилося місто, тобто міські якісь комунальні служби. І Харків перетворився на таку фортецю, яка трималася, яка не здавалася, не збиралася здаватися. Це було перші тижні доволі важко, тому що над містом літала авіація, яка бомбила місто. Прильоти були постійні, масивні і доволі таки хаотичні. Прилетіти могло будь-куди, та, в принципі, як і зараз, але тоді це було більш масивно і більш масштабно. Тому доволі небезпечно було пересуватися містом. Наші волонтери постійно потрапляли під обстріли, дехто загинув. І це не говорю про військових, які, зрозуміло, на лінії фронту були в найбільшій небезпеці, та й до сьогодні є. В якийсь момент відбулося певне покращення ситуації, коли наші відкинули їх з околиці, спочатку там з боку п'яти хаток, потім з боку циркунів, коли росіяни втратили можливість бити по місту із градів. Ясно річ, це покращило ситуацію, далі в них була можливість лише бити ракетами, і, очевидно, в них вже не було таких великих можливостей для обстрілів. В якийсь момент це покращення відчулося, люди почали повертатися. Я не знаю, наскільки це хороша ідея. З одного боку, звичайно, хочеться, щоб в Харкові були люди, щоб він не був такий порожній, який він був перший місяць. З іншого боку, ну, зрозуміло, що кожен в цьому випадку бере на себе відповідальність, тому що, повторюся, прилетіти може будь-коли, будь-куди. Знаєте, сьогодні вночі, попри те, що нібито ми живемо вже в більш-менш спокійному місті, цілу ніч були якісь прильоти, десь бабахало. Тому війна, ясна річ, закінчилася, розслаблятися в жодному разі не можна. Наші хлопці, дівчата пробують йти в контрнаступ, відтісняють їх від, від міста. Росіяни, слід сказати, так легко не відходять. Тому війна триває, вона триває зовсім близько від околиці Харкова. Ясно річ, що на якісь речі дивитися дуже боляче, на зруйновані будинки, зруйновані історичні пам'ятки. Хоча я зрозуміло, що найстрашніше – це гибель людей і наших військових, і наших цивільних. 
Перший тиждень це взагалі було важко бачити велику кількість загиблих на подвір'ях моргів. Бачити всі ці, всі ці речі зблизька, звичайно, воно не, не дуже легко було. Зараз є це певна така ілюзія того, що Харків відбився. Ну, це не ілюзія, Харків дійсно відбився, але це зовсім не означає, що росіяни сюди знову не ломануться. Інша річ, що тут за цей час створилася велика кількість нових підрозділів. Сюди прийшло багато військових, які відвоювали під Києвом. Стеж феномен, коли сюди приходять ті підрозділи Центральної України, Західної України, заходять, починають воювати, власне, не сильно зважаючи на те, чи це Схід України, чи це Північ України. Ну, власне, війна триває, сьогодні 101 день цієї війни, і, очевидно, завтра вона не завершиться. Але і ми нікуди не розходимося. It's impressive how, for example, what the work is being done by Jadan and his friends. So every day they are, they are moving around in, in the city, bringing some humanitarian aid, bringing some help to Ukrainian soldiers on the front line. So they really turn, they're really a big volunteer center. Another aspect of this volunteer center is the church, the church, uh, Svetodmitrivska Tserkva. Uh, which is headed by uh, by Bishop uh, Igor, who is also our colleague because he is uh, an expert in ancient literature and he's is professor, he's Kif professor also professor at Kiev Mahil Academy at the department which where we are teaching as well. A remarkable person as well who turned mm-hmm. this church. Isichinko. Yes, who turned this church uh, into a into a volunteer center in which people get assistance to the to the people who are suffering to the people so we are ourselves witnessed so a big line every day a big line to the church to but, get to get bread but not o- not only because what i was personally impressed is that the fact you arrive into a church so you are there and out of the blue you see a military car ukrainian military car arriving to this church and you see volunteers putting some, let's say, some important things for soldiers in the front line. And so this guy is coming to the front line directly from the church. So this is not about only about civilians. It's also about military aid. And this kind of link between church and military, it is impressive, as well as what we are talking about, about Sergei Jadan and all these uh, people from these cultural networks. I mean, not only um, poet uh, Jadan, but also people from theater, people uh, um, uh, director of literature museum so all these people who are in the sphere of art of literature music theater whatever they uh, are courageous they were courageous enough to stay in the city not to leave their city and not only to stay but also to help others and to organize some kind of uh, real assistance they uh, were telling the story how they were driving in this extremely dangerous Kharkiv in the in in during March on a- in April they driving extremely fast even today so when even you have in Kharkiv a lot of cars and it's becoming dangerous to drive so fast they were trying to escape this constant shelling so it's something really really amazing and the fact that these very this this particular artists and Jadan and some others people who are uh, I would I would say revolutionary in their aesthetics they're quite close to a church which is normally considered to be, I don't know, conservative place, but it is not conservative. And at the same time, they are close, close to military. This kind of uh, union uh, is quite impressive, was very much impressive for me. We also brought uh, assistance to Kharkiv and uh, to our listeners, to our pa- patrons, let me say a, a big word of gratitude because we, we got this assistance from your donations. So we, we use basically your donations uh, not to support ourselves, but to support people who, who need this support, including the Ukrainian resistance, including those people who are in need. Kharkiv is a, is a big cultural center and it is so remarkable that it, its history it's you know for russians it's a russian speaking city where people really are dreaming to join russia which is of course not the case although it is a mostly russian speaking city despite the fact that many people are now speaking ukrainian in 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 kharkiv but interestingly is that uh, well now when they they have been shelling the city with grads I mean, I cannot really imagine how people in Kharkiv would want to join the Russian, the so-called Ruski Mir, the Russian world. It, Kharkiv is, is an impressive place for Ukrainian culture, because Kharkiv and the so-called Slobitska Ukraina, Slobozhanchina, is a 
We can also say that this is a place where the concept of Ukraine was born in the early 19th century. Of course, the, the word Ukraine uh, was uh, used in, uh, in the chronicles much earlier during the medieval times, but to, uh, to, designate, uh, to designate this idea of, uh, uh, of, of the country, which was during the medieval times was called Rus, during the Cossack times was called Visko uh, Zaporizhsky, meaning the Zaporozhian host, Zaporozhian army. Mm -hmm. and, and this idea was coming from the Kharkiv Romantics, from the people like Kostomarov, from people like Bilozersky, Kvitko Snovyanko, Hulakov Artemovsky. All these and, people living in Kharkiv. Yes, and uh, Kharkiv also a place of... Uh, a big university, which is older than university in, in Kiev, the, the Shevchenko University or St. Volodymyr University, which is not older, of course, than Kiev Mahil Academy, but but still a very, a very important. Kharkiv is a place of Grigory Skovoroda as well, right? And so, his museum, let us remind, was shelled several weeks ago in uh, Lozova. In Lozova, if I'm not mistaken. Skorod Skorodinivka. Skorodinivka. Skorodinivka, yes. So this is a museum and it was a quite a de deliberate attack against this museum because this museum is somehow isolated from other buildings. So in the, it was a missile attack. And this We is hope a, to go to this museum and maybe make yeah. a podcast there. Let's, uh, About, let's yeah. do that. There were no victims uh, at that moment, but uh, this is a kind of, this is the approach of Russian, Russian army to Ukrainian culture. Let us also remind that in the beginning of 20th century, it was a place of this um, a brilliant uh, renaissance, renaissance of, uh, of culture, I mean, in, in, in literature, in theater, theater, theater Brazil, for example, in photography as well. All these people were extremely active, and uh, there is also House Slovo, Budinok Slova. This is a kind of sim symbolic place where many dozens of writers lived in the beginning of 20th century, for example, as Hvilovi. And this building was also touched by this artillery shelling. It's not destroyed, not at all destroyed, but some only some windows and some signs of this uh, of this war on this uh, building. Uh, so a lot of a lot of people and a lot of different generations. And Kharkiv now is a quite quite a dynamic place. This is not a museum. Kharkiv lives its own a dynamic uh, cultural life and this is uh, extremely interesting that people from culture they stayed in the city and for example they were talking we were talking to people from theater and uh, from for example uh, director was telling us a story as they played they staged um, this um Surgical place in the, in metro in Kharkiv metro during March and April and people were living a lot in the metro because metro is quite a secure place to live when there is sh shelling and they were go going down and playing I don't know every kind of concerts or plays for people who were living in the underground. Yeah, there were many many concerts, even the rock and, concerts. And, and that's that's something that didn't happen in Kiev, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember these kind of things in Kiev. In Metro, there, there were of course there concerts, were, of, course. of course, and there were even concerts with the, with the big stars who came to Kiev, like yeah, but Bono. It was in April. It was in April. Already. Like Bono. We see something very symbolic and very important. I mean, very vital. Something very vital for the city. So city is defending itself not only just not only to defend itself but also to protect its culture, to protect its people. People who are who are not afraid to stay in the, such a city and to continue what they are already doing. And by the way, we are organizing discussion, this pen uh, Ukrainian Ukraine pen discussion also in the underground of the state university, kind of underground, which is at the same time a kind of art place, art gallery. Mm -hmm. Yermilov, Yermilov Center. Center. Yermilov is a also great Ukrainian Kharkiv constructivist and artist and Kharkiv constructivism is a very important thing so you can uh, look at the great building I think of Ukrainian constructivism the Dershprom I mean it's a remarkable remarkable example of this constructivism of this geometrical uh, uh, geom ideal geometrical forms. I love this building so much, and and people who are interested in the this Kharkiv avant-garde, I hope they know it uh, too. Another, for example, a famous personality in Kharkiv is Yuri Shevilov, who is one of the greatest philologists, Ukrainian philologists, uh, also the linguists, 
and uh, kind of a competitor to Roman Jakobson, the Russian uh, Russian linguist. You, for example, wrote once an article about Jakobson and Shevilov. Uh, okay. Jakobson is overestimated, Shevilov is underestimated globally, in, my, in, in our opinion. But also Shevilov is a great literary critic and a great center of this renewal of Ukrainian culture, uh, literary culture nowadays, because he's a great intellectual. And now in Kharkiv, you have a, his apartment, uh, who is now turned into the literary residence. So there is a place where you can have, for, for example, discussions, you can have also concerts, little concerts. And in the Slovo uh, building, also there is a, a literary res a residence. So there is also these places which are connected to the uh, li literature museum, Lit Musei, and its director, uh, Tityana Pilipchuk, who is uh, kind of also one of the drivers of this process. And it's remarkable how, how it's now living, how it's despite all this. So all those people stayed in, in the city and, and continue to this. I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by these people. These people, strong people, but at the same time, very culturally sophisticated, wise, educated, are, are this image of, of, of Ukraine right now. This is the heart of this resistance, yeah. So this was our, our trip to Kharkiv, and we, we also try to post a lot of videos on our Twitter, Twitter Ukraine World. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, this episode of our pod podcast, Explaining Ukraine. This is a series done uh, jointly by Ukraine World and Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Tetiano Harko, my, myself is Volodymyr Yermolenko. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine. But if you want to support us, you can do it on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ukraine World. As we told you, we spend these donations mostly on helping people and bringing uh, aid to, to places which are on the front line or which have suffered from the war and by this connecting different Ukrainian cities. So stay with us and stand with Ukraine.